Hello, I'm Tara Rapsol. I'm the Dean of Graduate Research and the Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University. And welcome to this weekly podcast on capital T... I think I'm going to give it a capital T, capital T theory. And this podcast comes after a series of very interesting conversations with not only my PhD students at Flinders, but the students more generally in the population. I've had a whole series of really interesting conversations and meetings talking about the value of theory. And as I posed with the wonderful students I've been talking with, I said, if you're not doing theory... What precisely do you think you're doing? Do you think you're telling the truth? So in this ponderous mood, I thought I would involve the other Professor of Cultural Studies at Flinders University, Professor Steve Redhead, to discuss really the two T's, theory and truth. So we want to do a big shout out to Andrew Patterson, our wonderful PhD student who is doing a lot of work in and on and around theory at the moment in his wonderful PhD. But Steve, let's help Andrew and our wonderful mates all around the world. What is theory, capital T or otherwise? Yes, it's a very good question, I think, because in this recent book that I've uh, written, Theoretical Times, I was trying to wrestle with that and why why the, um, the disciplines, whatever discipline you're talking about, have become so conservative and inward and, mm. um, you know, and empiricist, yeah. which I think is worth thinking about. In other words, they often think that there isn't theory to be had. And that's why the postgraduate students add a chapter on theory in their PhD and they think that's what they're doing. Is the theory chapter? When did that, when did that become Exactly. A and I think that's <laughs> symptomatic of this problem of squeezing theory out And in theoretical times, what I was trying to do was to look at how you could develop post-disciplinary theory. Lovely. But I think a lot of the time what the postgraduate students are wrestling with is actually how they can develop interdisciplinary theory and how theory can organise their PhD, not just in a chapter, but in the whole body of knowledge, the original body of knowledge that they're trying to produce. Yeah, I think that's powerful. When I used to teach it to, again, coursework master student, students, which is a very different paradigm, I used to simply teach you know, the what might be subject information, if you will. Methods are the how, and yes. theories are the why. Yes. And unless you're answering the why, the what and the how, to be frank, are meaningless. So therefore, what is the function of theory in knowledge? I'm almost getting from you that it's punctuation for knowledge, but what is its function in knowledge and indeed in the development, perhaps, of new knowledge? Yeah, I think, I mean, I certainly think we've kind of lost that debate, which certainly in the humanities and social sciences was a really important one at one time, about epistemology. In other words, about the theory of knowledge and the theory of the production of knowledge. And I think one of the points that I I would make is that it is a matter of organisation. So you're organising through theory and you're organising your your body of knowledge through theory. It's not something that's an add-on. It's not something that's an afterthought. And of course that's what empiricism produces, theory as an afterthought. So it really is, theory is grammar. I I threw that in there, punctuation Mm. as sort of a, a metaphor, but actually theory is grammar. Language doesn't exist without grammar. We rarely think about it, but language doesn't exist without grammar. Mm. Similarly, knowledge doesn't exist without theory. It is the punctuation. I love how you've talked about it as being the organisational mode Mm. of producing knowledge. And interestingly, in Andrew's chapter, we are using it in that way. I haven't realised, but he is using theory as a way to organise incredibly rich information and knowledge development. That's really. right, the raw data. So, yeah. you know, theory organises the raw data. Yeah, I, I think that's brilliant. I, I'm going to ask you the, the, the meta question with all of this, Steve. Do you think this anti-theory movement is part or linked in with anti-intellectualism? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt that that's the case. I think, um, again, what I was trying to do in the book Theoretical Times was to show how 
post-disciplinary theory could be produced and indeed identify theorists and theory which fitted into that and particularly the politics of that theory. But I was been slightly ironic when I talked about theoretical times, although it's caught on as a catchphrase. It has, we're getting the T-shirt. <laughs> but <laughs> actually, it is an anti-theoretical times that we live in. It's an empiricist times. And those empiricisms in the disciplines have been coming for decades. So theory was squeezed out, um, really... From the, I think from the 1960s and 70s onwards, in all the disciplines. And what we're now picking up on is how, how deep that has gone and how theoretical times really uh, is a rallying cry to move away from that and to develop theory in a new way and a, a new politics of theory. And I mean, I'll just put in there, we always try and mention Trump at some point during mm. during these podcasts and Brexit and so forth, and they were anti-expertise movements. Yes, they were. But mm. also, and I'll, I'll call a spade a shovel, I know people don't like it when I do this, but you know, I really, at this juncture, you know, it's so serious at the moment, what's happening on the planet, I think we've got to be clear on this. The, the victory of the stupid, the victory of particularly the ignorant, mm. is so powerful that we're allowing people who are ignorant who do not read, who do not think, who do not engage with higher level ideas to run the military, run health systems, Mm. run education. I mean, this is not going to end well, is it? No, and it hasn't ended well. And I think the empiricist times that I'm talking about have indeed produced uh, the rise of the right. There's no question about that, in my view. Um, That ideology has been developed um, and in a time when people have become more and more empiricist. And it's interesting that there's a parallel development. You know, I would point to the political development, say, in the UK at the moment, where um, a Corbyn-led Labour movement actually did a great deal better in the most recent election than people thought, and the chant, Oh, Jeremy Corbyn, has become like a national anthem. And so explain to people who are not in the United Kingdom, where does that chant actually come from, which gives it great popularity? Yeah, it's a football chant. It's actually uh, the mode, the template is actually a football chant. So, Oh, Jeremy Corbyn is the chant based on people's great affection, actually, and admiration for a left leader who's been prepared to say the unsayable against these empiricist times. And I think that's a really good example. You can pick it up in many other countries too. Uh, But that is a great current example. And also, he is a man of ideas. I think Macron is interesting too. There are some new and interesting ideas coming from the centre-right as well. This is not just a a leftist movement. And and certainly I'm a big believer in progressivism wherever we may find it. I'm a big believer in ideas wherever, wherever we may find it. And I think... When uh, Jeremy Corbyn cited Shelley at mm. Glastonbury, that was probably the most interesting, positive, thinking, theoretical moment you could ever enact, really. Yes, it's, it's, it's a remembrance of previous intellectual times and the need for current theoretical times. And also, as you and I talked about when we saw it, and obviously we, we weren't at Glastonbury, we weren't actually in the United Kingdom, I'd just returned... When, when it happened, but it summoned E.P. Thompson, yes. and E.P. Thompson's speech at Glastonbury really powerfully, I think. Very much so. Thompson was speaking at Glastonbury in the 1980s when he was very much involved in CND and to fight exterminism. Well, we have to fight exterminism again in the Trump land. So I thought that was a, a really great sort of cyclical summoning yeah of progressivism at Glastonbury. And people are going, oh, look, well, that that wasn't right. You know, that's not what Glastonbury's about. It's what Glastonbury's always been about. Yeah, I think so. Really interesting. Now, Steve, we've already talked about empiricism and the empirical. How do we as scholars, how do we as researchers critique these empirical times? Yeah, I mean, as I say, I think I would point to them as empiricist times. I think the point about You've empirical research... Yeah, I mean, empirical research is great because it's data, it's evidence... Absolutely. Driven. Empirical research is, again, something which should be organised by theory. Lovely. That's really the most important lesson of our times, and that empirical research can be better and more developed and more influential in policy terms if it is theoretically driven. Yeah, I like that a lot, because you don't want to be anti-fact 
no. or anti-research or anti-data or anti-information at all. No, and it's the absolutely exact opposite not. of that. Yeah. But data without an organising principle is not only irrelevant but also very dangerous. Yes. Do you agree with that? I do, and that's where post-truth comes from. <laughs> that's pretty clear. Last question. And we'll turn to our wonderful PhD students, wonderful Andrew and all the wonderful students I see in my office. Why should theory matter to PhD students? If you're a young researcher or indeed an early career researcher of any age, why does an attention to theory help your career? Well, I think it, make, it makes you a more rounded scholar. Mm. It will always produce better work. Ooh. And if you're a PhD examiner of experience like you and I are, you'll see that straight away in a PhD. That's not to say that PhDs haven't passed when they've been empiricist, but actually the work is so much more rounded and so much more scholarly. I think that's a great point. I've never thought about it in that way. When you have a student who really gets theory Mm. in depth, it adds maturity, it adds scope, and the difference, you're absolutely right, it adds a worldview. Mm. So this is a student who understands this slither of original contribution to knowledge, which is what a PhD is, but they situate the slither in a worldview, and it gives you a sense of a a vista of knowledge, which is very powerful. And that will help them in their career, because they'll touch on that vista. The PhD is really, really small within that vista, but actually their career certainly an academic career, can be a reasonable part of that vista. And if I can give one final example, and a big hello to Sunny, who's currently under examination, everything crossed for her, but she was looking at African migrants in Australia, yes. so that's empirically driven. She had some fantastic data sets. Absolutely wonderful. But she had placed through that study Stuart Hall's The Great Moving Right Show. Yes. And that theoretical suite added power and punch to what is a really rich, evidentially driven thesis. Very much so, and she can show that she's part of an international cultural studies movement as part of that work. Steve, thank you very much for this conversation. Really interesting and, again, very timely in a culture that seems to be driven at the moment by Donald Trump's tweets. (laughs) 